when the Canadian federal government passed Bill C-38 in June of 2005 and finally legalized same-sex marriage, they and all those who paved the way made history. I'm Harold Damaris, and I became involved in gay liberation in 1972 in Windsor, Ontario. And in 1980, I was the first paid employee of the Coalition for Lesbian and Gay Rights in Ontario, at that time Seagro. When Toronto's Church and Wellesley Business Improvement Area wanted to investigate the history of the neighborhood, they turned to the Canadian Lesbian and Gay Archives. And what they found was a gay and scandalous Canadian pioneer, Alexander Wood. For me to understand the history of the Lesbian and Gay, or the history of Church and Wellesley, um, the first place I went to was the archives. So I went and, you know, I, I went over to the archives location on Temperance Street and, you know, it was very late at night and, you know, I could tell there was obviously it wasn't a well-funded project. Like, and there were a group of dedicated volunteers sitting at the tables, clipping things out of the newspaper. And I had said to someone who said, may I help you? And I said, yes, I'm from the Church in Wellesley, you know, BIA. I am uh, putting together the introductory um, portion of our strategic plan. And I would like to talk about the history of Church and Wellesley, and um, and specifically, I wanted to know more about Alexander Wood. The fellows at the uh, the archives were very very helpful. They pulled out a little folder for me and said, "This is everything we have on Alexander Wood." The only known uh, likeness of Alexander Wood was the silhouette, and I put this on one side of the medal, and I put his name on the uh, underneath the silhouette. And on the back, I put um, ho uh, Molly Wood's bush. And um, that was um, land that he bought in 1826, and it's north of Carlton and east of Young Street. And it was called Molly Wood's bush because uh, Molly was a derogatory name for a gay man or homosexual in those days. Uh, on the other medal, I put uh, relief of Alexander Wood. And on the back of it, I put 1810, the scandal. And that's when Alexander Wood was a magistrate. And with his power as a lawmaker, he uh, uh, was approached by Miss Bailey, who said she had been raped, and she had scratched the genitals of the rapist. So Alexander Wood hauled in some young men from Fort York and off the street, had them drop their pants, and was looking for the scratch marks on the genitals. Now when his superior, Judge Powell, found out about this, he was very, very angry. He told Alexander that he would have to leave or he would be fined or put in jail. So Alexander Wood went back to uh, Scotland and that was in 1810. And so when I brought the strategic plan and the drafts back to the board of management, um, you know, the chair said, you know, this is fantastic, this is great. And then it just sort of rolled into a conversation where we thought about, well, our history is not acknowledged. And it's hardly ever recognized, like officially recognized from the, from the state perspective. And, um, well, why don't we take care of this ourselves? Like, why don't we recognize our history? And the next thing you knew, we were, you know, commissioning the, uh, the creation of this sculpture. Most people think that gay history if it exists at all, started in the late 1960s with the Stonewall Riots in the United States. But as the strange story of Alexander Wood shows us, gay history goes back long before the 1960s, even in Canada. Still, many queer lives remain hidden from history, unrecorded, tucked away in drawers and in photo albums because people think that the stories aren't worth telling. That gay history isn't important, which is why the Canadian Lesbian and Gay Archives exists, to keep our stories alive and to make it clear why history, gay history, is so important. There's a saying in, um, in Chinese, it's sort of one of those proverbial phrases that um, uh, a, a tree must have very strong roots in order for it to know who it is. And you know, the stronger the roots and the deeper the roots go into the ground, the stronger and more magnificent a tree becomes. Oh God, history gets, I think it's important for all of us to know our history and history gets lost so quickly. Um, and 
I remember watching the video, paragraph 175, that was just produced, I guess, in the last five years. And the historian, so it was, it was produced by a German historian, and he talked about not knowing the history that gay men um, had been targeted by the Nazis, had been interred in the concentration camps, um, that laws had changed. He didn't know that history and didn't know that there were survivors from there. So his video was an, was an act to try and, and um, um, you know, make sure that that history didn't get lost. Um, I think in our own communities, um, there's still some of us who are coming out in, in later lives, and uh, there's still youth who are afraid and, and don't know um, what's out there. So it's important to, to maintain that history to know that we've come before. And I think that a community that loses its history isn't a community. It's essential to know that there have been people doing this kind of work um, for forever. I think there's definitely something important, specifically important, about LGBT history and the importance of keeping it alive. We've been, as a, as a culture, we've been almost erased from history books, even though our communities have existed as part of, well, basically every culture since the beginning of time in different capacities. And the fact that we've been systemically erased from those history books proves the importance of history. It proves that by trying to erase us, trying to pretend that we never existed at all, trying to pretend that we never had a rich and diverse cultural background amongst different cultures, it's a way to control us and to oppress us. So the, the way to fight back is to reclaim our history. We can parallel this with the struggle of First Nations people in Canada. So here is a population that by any, by any a uh, definition of genocide could have been, should have been wiped out. And these are people that are uh, flourishing and surviving um, under the worst adverse conditions possible. And they do this without military warfare. And they do this without, um, you know, c commerce. But what they do is they, um, they ensure that their language and history flourishes within their community. And through the, um, through the telling of their history, and through the promotion and preservation of their language. The fact that the, I had no human rights protection in this province when I came out, and we didn't get it till 1986, well, it wasn't a matter of I'm not going to do political work. I'm absolutely going to do political work, and then getting basic human rights protection was one big step. But then, it, I mean, they're always, homophobia and heterosexism were still rampant, and people were still are, but certainly in those days were discriminated against incredibly blatantly. So it's not about stopping at some point. And you know, so now, as of this week, you know, we have equal marriage. So yippee! You know, I'm not I'm not a person who wants to run out and get married. Anyway, even though I have a partner and a child, that's still just another step. And I think that it's really important, especially for young people, to understand that that all these basic rights that we have, and I see them as rights, not privileges. There's nothing special about this. Basic rights that we have, we could lose tomorrow. And you see that right now with Stephen Harper saying, if I get in this next election, I'm gonna change, this, I'm gonna change the definition of marriage again. So I want young people to really understand that um, I think it's great that they take their rights for granted. That means that we did a good job. That means that all those years of work paid off for them. But my fear is, that they're going to forget what the history is and that we're going to lose, you know, I'm going to be too old then or I'm going to be dead and, we're going to, and there's going to be a time when we start losing those rights. So it's really important for young people to understand that everything we have right now we could lose tomorrow. And a couple of years ago I remember um, one of the um groups of young people were organizing some events and they organized a, a party for Caribana and they built it as the very first Caribana, gay Caribana party. And I was outraged, right? You know, that kind of old, older generation. How did, what do these kids think they know? And, you know, and I thought, we organized a party back in the 80s, and, you know, and it was full, and it was tons of people, and it was, I can't believe they think. And so, you know, and I, but then I realized part of the thing was they were doing it out of not knowing that there had been these events that had occurred. And so, in 
connecting with some of the people who are organizing and having some dialogue with them, we started talking, and they were like, wow, but you know, the huge thing here is we don't, they, they said, we don't have that history. We crave that history. And in fact, one of the groups now, Black Queer Youth, they're actually, their big quest right now is to document um, and talk to uh, people who were there. I mean, they make me feel like really old because they go the seniors or the elders of the community, right? Um, and I guess you just have to take, you know, it's just what happens. Um, so I think the thing about history then is that, you know, one of the things that it gives people, it basically gives you information. Two, it lets you know what's happened before. Three, it also gives you um, resources, right? So you can tap into people, and it also gives you experience. If it weren't for the struggles and the challenges of those who came before us. So I think remembering history is about honoring our heroes. Back in 1997, I was still living in Jordan, and I worked um, in this media company, online media company called Arabia Online. And I mean, it's, it's a very conservative, you know, uh, um, just environment in the in the country and all that. And me and an editor who worked with me, I worked in the newsroom doing the graphics for them and stuff. And the editor, because she knows me and she knows I'm gay, had a, an idea of. of writing an article, a story on, on gay Arabs, on homosexuality in the Arab world. So I helped her with that, connected her with the, some people and, and stuff, and, um, and she did the, the story. And it was online for 24 hours before the, the sponsors pulled it out. That, that story, that article, that piece, um, when she wanted to write it, she digged in and she did some research, and she found out that actually, 50 years ago, and 60 years ago, and 70 years ago, in our small Arab communities, in small towns even, there's lots of people who were gay and lesbian, and who were living there, almost out, and people knew about them, and, and nobody really cared, and people tolerated them and lived with them. And just because history was not documented, and lots of it was, was lost, and there's no attention to certain things like, you know, gay, stories, who cared back then. This is important that we document it and we, we keep track of what's going on, so we prove them wrong even now. I think it's very important to document history uh, because one, um, you know, there are different kinds of history that actually does get documented and some people's histories never get documented. So I do think it's important to document history and for um, for different communities to document their own history. So to be able to tell their own stories in their own voice, um, you know, so that, you know, I can talk about a black history here in Toronto and organizing within the black community, organizing within queer community, um, and what my experience of that has been, you know, as a black woman. And so I think it's really important for different communities to do that, but also to recognize the connectivity and some of the similarities between communities so that we're both talking about you know people speaking for themselves but that there's also a collective struggle um, that no struggle is a struggle in and of itself but in fact you know um, by working together and by you know um, finding our points of commonality and working through um, our differences that then we can build stronger struggles Politically, politically, if you don't have a sense of your history and archive, then you really are orphaned in the present. Like you have no idea when issues come up, what's gone before. And because our clubs and social spaces are so age um, barriered, like you get everybody who's from 20 to 35 and then 35 a little bit, they may sit to 40, but then after that nobody ever sees anybody again and there's never anything where everyone comes together, maybe Gay Pride Day a little bit, but it's so dominated by a party that there's absolutely no other way to pass on oral history, even of the recent past, much less so. I think that, um, that when we share our stories um, as gay people uh, with um, the broader population, that it also empowers them um, because there's much that um, I think that we can share in terms of common visions and common goals. Um, when you're struggling against oppression, uh, whether that oppression be homophobia, whether it be racism, whether it be uh, sexism, um, whether it be anti-Semitism or other forms of religious uh, hatred, um, to the extent that we've been able to, to, to challenge those phobias and those hatreds and, and overcome them, um, we have lessons to share. I think also we should celebrate our history. 
um, we have a lot to, to celebrate as, as, as gay people. I mean, we've traveled a remarkable journey. And, uh, and I think it's a wonderful story. And uh, when, when I hear, for example, the stories of, of, of people like George Hislop and Jane Rule and others, um, and I, I find them inspiring and I find them moving, and I find them empowering. And I know that it's not just me that finds them that way, it's, it's other people as well. And you, you know, whether you're straight or gay or bi, um, those stories should be heard and should be told and should be celebrated as part of the fabric of this country. I mean, we as gay people are a, 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 an integral part of this country and ha have helped to build the country and shape the country. And our histories are, are enmeshed in the history of, of, of this country. Um, and most people don't know that. Um, most people, in fact, tragically, um, for many people, the first real visibility of gay people came with the epidemic of, of AIDS, of HIV and AIDS. That's when people first discovered that there are all these remarkable people everywhere in Canada who also happened to be gay. Tragically, they discovered that because they discovered that they were dying in some cases, or died. Um, and, and, and that's, for many people, so it was the first awareness of, 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 of the reality of, largely in that case, of gay men. But we've been invisible for too long, and our stories haven't been told. And I think that telling our stories, preserving our stories, which is why the archives are so incredibly important, one of the reasons why the archives are so important, um, and then sharing those stories to celebrate and learn and to empower. I think all of those are important. For more than 35 years, the Canadian Lesbian and Gay Archives has been making sure that the stories of LGBT Canadians got preserved for the future. When a small group of activists started hoarding materials in the early 1970s, they were starting a community institution that would last into the next millennium. Uh, the Archives was born as the Canadian Gay Liberation Movement Archives. It grew out of the files and records and material collected by the body politic, which was central to the Canadian Gay Movement. Um, that focus was seen to be kind of narrow after a point that we were trying, that Ed Jackson, when he was sort of shepherding it through the early 70s, uh, felt that it needed to have a broader focus, and the, that, which is, so he took the words liberation movement out of the title. Clearly, we're still going to collect a lot of the same material, but it also could collect stuff that wasn't related to, to politics per se, to just how we lived as people, um, which got to things like all of the very social groups and baseball teams. I mean, there are baseball uniforms in the archives, uh, matchbooks and, uh, you know, placemats and all kinds of things from, from our social lives and our domestic lives. And uh, to me, that was, to Eddie then, and, and still, that's very important uh, to what the Argus is about. It's a repository that can tell people down the road how we lived, um, and they may not even recognize who we were by then. We might seem as very strange characters calling ourselves strange names. Early on, uh, I guess around 75, we had an offer from the Provincial Archives to simply take the material, which would have meant that they would have uh, preserved it, uh, organized it, um, and taken the burden of that whole burden off of us. And where, where the archives was at the time, up at 93 Carlton Street, certainly wasn't a very secure space. It was just a storefront. It was, you know, great big windows in the front. People could have smashed in anything. Um, but in the end, we decided that it was more important to keep it in our hands for a number of reasons. And the, the biggest reason was access to it, that uh, we wanted to make sure that other people, that nobody had to go through all kinds of academic or official hoops to get to use this material. Um, and also that we were probably better placed than anybody to figure out what's important to keep, why, uh, how will people want to find this in the future, what mechanisms would you we'd need. Uh, we, we understood the material and we felt it was important to, for that to continue which is why the archives never was made part of any other larger archival institution. Because we don't have, often in our community, our own children to pass our history to. More and more there are. But the vast majority of gay men, lesbians, uh, do not have 
uh, children to pass the, the story of our history. So the archives, I think, is our family album. I mean, I think it's important for gay people to tell gay history like it's important for any group of people to tell their own history, partly because there's a way that we know that history. There's a way that um, we bring a whole context to why that's important. Um, and our own experiences of, you know, it's like growing up isolated, growing up feeling like you're the only one. Growing, I mean, you know, it's like as a black person growing up, um, understanding a way that I have to live in the society, the culture that someone who's not black doesn't understand. So as a queer person, a gay person, understanding what it's like to, you know, having to look, be as a kid in school, looking around me and, and, and carrying information inside me quietly, privately, while I'm trying checking out the boys kind of thing, right? Um, the games I've had to learn to play to navigate and survive. Even now, as somebody who's out, still being in context where I've got to still play certain kinds of games, there's a way that only I can talk about that. You know, and I can talk about it to other queer folks, and we can talk about that. And I think that straight people can understand, can you know, have ways of um, uh, intersecting with that, or, or have parallel experience that they can. But I don't think it's ever the same, right? Exactly. And I think that if we want to have that sharpness of the history and that richness of the history, it's really important for us to tell those stories. When I was researching my historical novel in Sri Lanka, which was set in the 1920s, the archives in Sri Lanka had detailed information on everything the British did in the 1920s, what they wore, what they ate, the stoves they used, the ice boxes they had, the music programs they listened to. But there was nothing about what Sri Lankans did in the same period. And in fact, most of the information I did collect, I had to collect through oral history. Now that again is, a, is an instance of people, decide, somebody deciding what gets archived. And those somebodies who were archiving that stuff at that period were British. So they were not interested in what the Sri Lankan people thought or, 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 or ate or whatever. So I think, I think we can apply the same thing to the lesbian and gay archives. We, I mean, sure, you know, maybe, maybe other archives in our day and age will collect lesbian and gay information for sure. But we are not deciding what is being collected. It is not our decision and we, we can decide better because we are lesbian and gay what to keep and what not to keep. So I think that that's very important for the future. The mainstream culture likes to erase history, especially if it doesn't suit their purposes. Um, you know, as a Chinese person, for example, I never once learned about the Chinese Canadian contributions to the railroad ever in school. So I learned about, you know, the Chinese Canadian immigration experience and the Chinese Exclusion Act and the Chinese head tax through an organization called the Chinese Canadian National Con uh, Council that was trying to promote the history of Chinese Canadians in Canada. And without their active involvement, this nonprofit group, I would not have found out about my own person, you know, my people's experience and contributions to the country. Because basically we, we united this country. Federation would not have happened without the railroad. And that's a very important piece of history that I really connect deeply to, but I, wouldn't have, but I never learned it in school. And I think uh, if you look at what's happened in broader society and the acceptance of gays and lesbians, that wouldn't have happened if there hadn't been the kind of uh, attempts on the part of gays and lesbians beginning 40, 50 years ago, uh, starting to preserve our heritage. If their heritage wasn't there for people to look at, uh, to, re to observe, to use in making films, uh, uh, or in writing plays, in writing books, then uh, we would probably still be fairly invisible. Mm -hmm. and. Uh, and when people died, uh, families would say, well, we know that Uncle Harold was like that, but mm -hmm. we don't want any evidence of this kept, so we will systematically destroy all his papers. Mm -hmm. And that, is a, that mm -hmm. has traditionally happened in the past, and uh, it's still going on in some areas. Well, it's very important to have an institution like the Gay Archives around to, to keep evidence that we exist, for, first of all, and also to, um, to give credit where credit is due. There's been a lot of gay individuals out there who have contributed to the government, who have contributed to, uh, um, to con the, the laws, justice, the arts, for sure, 
Um, but in a lot of disciplines, gays and lesbians have contributed. And throughout history, history books won't, uh, don't, don't reveal that kind of information. I found when both doing Margaret's film, or the Stolen Moments film, what became Stolen Moments, and then starting to do our research on Canadian women of, you know, just pre feminism and gay lib, um, it couldn't have been done without the archive. It could not have been done without the archives. Without the lesbian and gay archives, I don't know how it could be done because um, when we went to straight archives, and we certainly did go to many archives uh, as well, you know, like photo archives and UBC archives, and there was hardly ever the category homosexuality or gay or lesbian. And so you couldn't really go there and find anything. And when there was the category, it was deviant and nobody was collecting the same information and you could never find it. Um, when Aaron and I put together the series on the police raids, for instance, in the cities, we combed through looking for stock footage because we didn't just want people to talk about it, you know, making a film, you actually want materials. We combed through every single piece of film stock footage the film board had with the word police in it. And that's how we found that amazing footage of the fight between the two women, the Butch Dyke and the Femme, and the, um, and you know, so you, you wouldn't find it, no one would say, was, there was no category. Mm -hmm. So I think that's, you know, I mean, how can that not be important? So it's the same thing in For Forbidden Love, the tabloids, we'd never, we would have had a nightmare finding the tabloid headlines. There would be no headlines in the film, you know, army of nude queers invades Hamilton, you know, that had to be Harold and the guys at the archives saying, oh, well, you have to look at these and they'd get a dusty box out and we'd sit there thinking, oh my God. And they're both hilarious and very frightening when you're looking at those real materials. So what's the importance of the archives? Well, as an artist, it's crucial. If you're going to deal with history at all, you have to have an archive. And I don't think I trust anyone else to keep it in the same way or the same kind of collection because nobody's going to collect with that much passion. Passion is the real power behind the archives. As a volunteer-run organization, the archives has been running on passion power for decades. Through the dedication of the volunteers and its donors, the CLGA provides a safe and positive environment for curious researchers and artists, young and old, to explore. A place where they don't have to look over their shoulders when they come to investigate their own histories. I love the archives and I love the connections we've made. Um, and I can remember one year we took a class to the archives and this was probably the first year and the archivist we were working with thought he led us back into sort of the bowels of the archives which is there's probably arch archivists out there who are shuddering in their in their boots right now going oh my god they didn't but so they led us back into the stacks and and what I what we had said is you know I know that the youth will be more connected with things you know like buttons and and matchbooks and t-shirts and you know posters done by hand practically and then um, and so they let the youth go back and sort of poke around in boxes and, and they were discovering things and they were excited. It's like, oh my God, look what I have! And, um, and at the end, I think the archivists were sort of sweating and they had to mop their brows and, and we agreed that we wouldn't do that part again, but that they would bring out some displays. Um, the importance of it resonates in their future. There are people who have been doing this work. This is a place where they keep all of that stuff. Certainly for our youth who go on to post-secondary, knowing that it's there, having already introduced them, having already walked in the door, sort of taken away the mystique of it, uh, is really important. Okay, my name is John, and I'm here at the Gay and Lesbian Archives because um, I'm making a documentary on focusing on the family and how they were opposed to same-sex marriage and how these ads came out during the federal election and I just wanted to use some resource materials that you guys have here. <laughs> and she's just oh, some... I'm she's just helping him. We're students from New York University um, and basically, yeah, this is for our thesis documentary. I found out about the archives because I called I was actually calling, I actually called Extra Magazine to use something from them and they told me that it was fine, that I could come down there and like photocopy something and bring it home. But then they recommended the archives to me. 
Well, the, the main thing that I needed, which I actually had this at home, but it was on the computer, on the internet, was this advertisement. Um, and I wanted to have it in actual newsprint without recreating it myself on a photocopier. Well, I just think, I think it's wonderful to bury yourselves in the archives, and I've done that, and, and, and to just trace the evolution of some different, uh, I mean, one of the things that, that there are in the archives is, is diaries, for example, and to read the diaries of, um, of gay men, uh, for example, in the late 70s and early 80s, and, and, uh, and, and to see how their lives, for example, were initially touched by the, the epidemic of, of HIV AIDS, and so to be in the archives and to be able to kind of trace that evolution and then gradually emerging from that, that horror and then recognizing that this isn't necessarily a death sentence. Um, but, I mean, people sometimes think of the archives as being manuscripts, and it's not just manuscripts. And one of the great things about the archives is it's all sorts of things. Over the decades, the archives has received a wide range of LGBT-related materials from individuals and organizations, newspaper clippings, books, magazines, personal letters, diaries and photographs, pamphlets, matchbooks, posters, audio and videotapes, buttons, t-shirts, and many other evocative objects. And, as with any other archives, it's always a challenge to decide what to keep and how to keep it. The material that comes in is in volume. Uh, books need to be catalogued, posters need to be catalogued, papers need to be arranged and described and that is very labor intensive and uh, uh, it takes a lot of time and it occupies a lot of space. Each of our uh, different types of media in the archives has to be catalogued and treated in a different way. We have databases that manage this stuff because we've always had a good volunteer base and this is a volunteer base with professional people professional librarians, professional archivists, almost from the very beginning when the archives was set up. I think it's very important to have uh, a professional gay archives, like we are, to be able to act as a repository for the basic uh, raw materials for the historical record, the gay and lesbian historical record, and to encourage um, serious researchers to come in and look at the material. Um, we have things that uh, are obviously pro-gay. We have things that are anti-gay, and it's very important to, um, to collect all of the material so that people can come in and look at the historic record and make their own decisions. One thing we are, have always argued is that we will not refuse something because we don't like what they are saying. Uh, we, we, are not, we don't approve of what these records are about or what they document. Uh, if you start using moral judgments on whether you're going to accept something, in an, particularly in archives like this, mm -hmm. you're, you're signing your death knell right there because you will lose all your credibility. And there's so much diversity in our communities that anybody would be a fool to say, no, we couldn't possibly uh, document that because we don't like it. An archives is a living, growing thing. It's always expanding. And a book is always static. It's an it's a encapsulation of a particular viewpoint at a particular time. Mm -hmm. Once you've started up an archives, uh, uh, you don't turn off the tap, and the material keeps flowing in. Mm -hmm. The nature keeps changing. Uh, manage, learning how to manage it keeps changing. We keep uh, adopting new techniques and how to best uh, look after material. Um, the breadth the, and the depth of the information you're collecting keeps changing, uh, mm -hmm. usually increasing. It keeps opening up new avenues for other research, for more books, uh, mm -hmm. uh, film, mm -hmm. video, plays. Basically what I do is I take care of our lesbian gay periodical collection. And it is, I think, probably the biggest collection in the world. We have about 7,000 titles from 65 countries, and it occupies perhaps maybe a, th a quarter of the floor space of the archives. And our strength, of course, is from the 70s, early 70s to the present, but we have some spectacular material from 
the 50s, definitely the 60s, a little bit from the 40s, 30s, and go back through time until the teens. And, and over the years, people who have been collecting periodicals have actually given them to us. They, they stop collecting them or they're moving or they need, they need the space. So the one thing that we can do is give people a tax credit for donations in kind. So some of these things are quite rare and worth a fair bit of money. So that's another way that we've managed to add to the collection. But we're about to participate in a, a microfilming project with uh, uh, primary source microfilm. And what we're going to do is microfilm 400 Canadian titles and 400 international titles. So about 800 in total, which is about 10% of what we have. A lot of the material is in newspaper format, pretty fragile, starting to age, and it's important now to capture this before we lose the, the evidence. So it's also a way to sort of get the material that we have to a larger audience. So many periodicals have an online source and don't publish paper copies anymore. It would mean that you'd have to cap capture the information to a disk or burn it to a CD or print it out and it's just impossible to keep up. So the changing media is uh, going to be something that most archives has to have to deal with. Up to this point, we actually are paper focused. And I've been with the archives for over 25 years. Um, in particular, I'm looking after the library, and it is called the James Fraser Library in memory of the man who originated the archives. James had a vision. Back in those days, there wasn't very much um, available about the gay community. It hadn't coalesced, particularly in the Canadian context, uh, but it was his aim to collect and preserve the history of our community and of gays in Canada. This collection is donation-based in many ways. How our collection grows could be seen in our um, shelf and a half about a books on transvestites and transsexuals. We didn't have a great many and oh about three or four years ago a, a gentleman came in asking to, to see the collection and mentioned that he had a number of things himself at home and he would be happy to donate them because he, he was pleased that we had the materials we did and as a result uh, the holdings we had more than doubled. Um, that's the kind of response we like to get. We, we go after people in the community, we go after users and ask them to consider us when they're cleaning off their shelves or if they're out and they see something they would like to buy and donate to the collection. We value somebody coming in for personal research just as much as the person who's doing a PhD thesis or writing a book. Although the Archives is an organization with an international scope, the thing that sets us apart is the richness of our Canadian content. These are our stories and we celebrate them. Periodically, the Archives National Portrait Committee commissions an artist to create a portrait of a queer Canadian who made history. Over the years, the National Portrait Collection has grown to become a multimedia who's who of Canadian gay history, and it's still growing. One of the first people to be immortalized in the National Portrait Collection was Jim Egan. Born in 1921, Egan was one of the greatest gay pioneers in Canadian history, and the CLGA has become the repository of his private papers. In 1948 was a very important year for Jim because not only did he meet his partner, uh, Jack Nesbitt, that year, and they were together for 52 years all together, um, but also in 1948, uh, Kinsey's report came out, uh, and of course that was a bombshell uh, for uh, sexuality studies. It was very much uh, played up on the press, pro and con, and uh, it really affected uh, Egan. He was an openly gay man by then, and so he was able to get into a sort of gay activism. And how he did this is by starting to write articles, and uh, particularly letters at the beginning, to newspapers, the tabloid press in Toronto. There were quite a number of them at that time. So in 1949, he started writing letters rebutting articles that had been uh, published there that were negative about homosexuality and quoting Kinsey and other studies about that. By 1953, he had jumped to a publication called Justice Weekly, where he um, published a 
two long series of articles. Each article would be, say, 500 to 1,000 words. And these were published uh, continuously on different uh, subjects, for example, on the Mattachine Society, on one, and all the other things that were happening in the rest of the world. These were told from a gay perspective. They were all positive. And to put this in perspective, when he started writing these things in 1949, there was no lesbian or gay liberation society in all of North America. In 1981, he was elected as a regional counselor for Comox Strathcona in BC. And he was actually the first gay person to be elected to elected office in Canada at that time. But I don't think anyone really noticed at that time. He was doing that until 1993. And of course, what he's best known for now, or Egan and Nesbitt, was the uh, spousal challenge for the, uh, the charter. That uh, was Egan versus Canada that came to the Supreme Court in 1995. Um, they actually lost it, uh, but the case was heard by the court and they actually decided to read in sexual orientation into the charter because of that case. And of course that opened up a whole floodgate of things. And we're still actually dealing with the repercussions from that now with uh, gay marriage and so on. I remember sitting down in, in a garden uh, with Jim Egan and Jack Nesbitt, um, a couple of the pioneers from, from British Columbia who fought to the Supreme Court of Canada for um, ultimately successfully for the right to include sexual orientation in the Charter of Rights. Um, and, th and, and thinking, boy, how many other people are there like this? Faceless, nameless people um, who've gone through so much. I think of people in the military and the struggles that they went through. Um, Bert Sutcliffe, who was uh, a you know, former major, and I, I remembering like yesterday him telling the committee that um, I sat on in 1985, I arranged for the Committee on Equality Rights to meet with him, and him talking to the committee with tears in his eyes about how he held a, a gun to his temple and, and, and came within just a, a heartbeat of, of, of shooting himself because he was so desperate after having been exposed as a gay man in the military. Well, this is one of the many stories that, that have to be told. From Jim Egan and Bert Sutcliffe to Alexander Wood, the Archives strives to preserve the stories of LGBT Canadians so that they can be discovered by new generations. After Dennis and the committee picked uh, the traditional theme, I built the maquette for the figure out of uh, clay, and then it was cast in bronze. And the maquette shows Alexander Wood as a man uh, about 24, 25 years old. He's dressed in the costume of the 1800s. This is the time of uh, uh, the ending of the French Revolution. And um, uh, the Scarlet Pimpernel, and people wore uh, uh, this style of clothing. I checked the fashions. Uh, on him, I also put, uh, in the silhouette, we could see that Alexander Wood wore a flower in his lapel. So on here, I put a rose. This is actually a tribute to uh, Trudeau. This is the Trudeau rose. And he has his walking cane. And some places in some of the reading, I read that he'd like to walk up and down the front of his store, which was one of three stores in York. And uh, he wore his long coat with his hands tucked in the sleeves to keep his hands warm. Um, he, in his store, he sold uh, many things, uh, fabrics and uh, beer and uh, flour. As also, he sold powder for your wigs because uh, uh, York was one of the last places in the British colonies where men wore wigs. It, we kind of like the fact that here's this guy that was way, uh, you know, far be, way before there was a sexual liberation movement, before the before the lesbian and gay movement was created. Here's this fella that was doing things all on his own, and he got into some trouble. But you know what we what we got out of it was he gave back to his community. And he gave back in so many ways by sitting on um, uh, the charitable foundations of the time and um, being a bit of a philanthropist and you know holding public office. And we really liked that because we thought, you know, this is the way we see ourselves within the lesbian and gay community. We want to be giving back to our community. We want to get connected to the community. We want to be engaged in civic politics and we want to have a say as 
um, in, in changing the way we do business on a, you know, perhaps from a government perspective and even, you know, organi organizing our community. And Alexander Wood at that time, um, you know, seemed to be doing everything that we, we are striving for within the lesbian and gay community. Since its founding, the Lesbian and Gay Archives has moved from one temporary location to another. But thanks to Toronto City Councilor Kyle Ray and the Children's Aid Society of Toronto, the Archives has been given a heritage building as a permanent location. Plans are underway to convert this 19th century house into a home for the Archives. Since we learned that the Children's Aid Society was going to be giving a house on Isabella Street, Street to the organization uh, through a land development deal, we have been able to imagine and dream a little more. We've recently gone through a planning exercise where we're working with a group of architects to develop a concept for the interior of the house and that includes creating uh, a, an enormous uh, three-story addition space in the rear for the, uh, for the collection itself. But as you walk in the door and it's a, uh, an 1860 house brick house on Isabella and it uh, has a simple Italianate features. You will walk up the steps and as you walk through the door on your right hand side there will be a display area. Uh, one of the great strengths of the archives is in the um, collections of objects, what, what people call ephemera. And none of them get to be seen unless you ask for them because they're, they're in a box or they're uh, off somewhere where you actually have to request them. Things go out for display sometimes uh, to conferences or events, but generally speaking there are a lot of materials that don't regularly get seen. So what we will have is a, a sort of a museum gallery space on the main floor that will have rotating displays. You'll also have a, a main uh, reading room with the, where the James Fraser Library will be. Um, I mean, there will be aspects of it, of it that will be a very modern facility, certainly in terms of storage and preservation. We'll have room to, uh, to expand the preservation work that's being done, and also we will have um, everything that's been in various storage facilities. The collection will finally come together in a way that simply hasn't been possible. If they have some uh, specific area that they'd like to do some work in, they can go up to the second floor where there will be a research, uh, research and reading room and that's where uh, people will be served and serviced with the collection that they uh, ask for. And then on the third floor there's a, uh, it's a boardroom, but it will also be a community space. So uh, one of the things that um, we're very aware of is that there is a, quite a lack of space in the Church Wellesley area for community groups to, uh, to have their meetings or have their parties or to have uh, events. And so the idea presently is to have a third floor that will both be um, a place for members of the CLGA to have their meetings, but also will be a, a community space. While preparing to move into its new home, the Archives has taken another big step. In November 2004, thanks to a grant from the Trillium Foundation, the Archives hired its first full-time employee, Len Milley. This year we were chosen as beneficiaries for the Pride and Remembrance Run. It would have been impossible for us to have done that because uh, it required that we uh, provide uh, a number of people to volunteer to support and it also um, required some organizational support. And it would have been very difficult for a person uh, who was volunteering to really have the time to do that so we were able to be confident that uh, that Len was going to coordinate that and so as a result uh, directly uh, we'll get nearly twenty thousand dollars probably this year from from the run. Along with these new projects the archives faces some remarkable opportunities to grow as an organization to better serve its changing community. Since the early 70s when the archives was founded Toronto has become one of the most multicultural cities in the world, 
and Canada has become a global destination. Amidst this transformation, the archives is striving to grow and change along with its community. The push for diversity is, should never stop because um, I think we all come from, all of us come from an attempt to be boxed in, to be molded into one expectation. Queer people know that better than anyone else, I think, that we're not just, you know, husbands or wives or doctors or garbage men or brothers or sisters, we're also queer. And on top of that, we're also people of color. We're also people with different religious backgrounds. And we're also people who speak different languages. And now we're looking at trans issues. We're looking at issues of racism within our community. We're looking at ageism, class issues. And I think that's just because we're an incredible community that can do that. We, we have those conversations. The straight world is not even dealing with those issues in the same way that we do. I think we have an openness to dealing with that, but it's hard. It's challenging to let go. The, the, the gay community in Canada has never been just a white community. It has never been. More than 50% of the population of Toronto are immigrants, right? So, and of course the same ratio would, would uh, reflect on, um, on queer people, and probably even more because like from my work I see the number, the huge number of, of immigrants and refugees who come here because of their sexual orientation. And they move here either from other countries or from smaller towns and other places in Canada to Toronto because of, of their sexual orientation. There have been so many uh, immigrants coming to the area. I think in about the mid-80s a lot of South Asians came in and um, naturally um, there were lesbian and gay South Asians and they you know filtered into the lesbian gay community and so I think it's important to to uh, acknowledge that in fact you know there have been black people there have been South Asian people there have been Aboriginal people you know a range of people involved um, and also out to differing degrees within the community over the past few years, there have been many, many uh, Middle Eastern uh, uh, lesbians and gays who have uh, sought refuge here, and um, this is, this is this is another phenomenon of sorts. And uh, so, there's a great opportunity for the archives to do invaluable work in talking to these people and uh, recording their stories. One of the experiences I have from working with immigrant youth and, and immigrant queer people through Salam or Soy is seeing that the mainstream queer community does not understand very well what, it is, what diversity is all about. I mean, there is the fetishizing about, you know, um, about certain races in terms of sexual references, preferences, but that's about it. Um, people who come from different places are not fitting in in the, in the queer community, the mainstream community. Um, kids who are coming from, from the Middle East or South America or, or South Asia are not feeling comfortable to go out to even the bars and the party scene because they just feel that they're, they're not fitting. We even, even go to mainstream queer service provider or organizations and they don't feel that they're having good experience or fitting in or getting what they want, they just feel ostracized even there. there there's always a danger that people get marginalized. I mean, we have been a marginalized community as a whole for so many years. And once you get out into the mainstream, there's always a danger that within that, people will get left behind. So the archives is one of the big institutions in the queer community. It, it should be at least something more prominent and more active in the community. And it, it needs to be a tool that, that educates the mainstream queer white middle class community that actually you're not the only ones who are there. It's not just one experience, one history, uh, but in fact it's that collection of histories that in fact has made the community um, what it is today and where it is today. So that, you know, addressing issues around racism within the community has helped to shape what the community looks like today. And I think it's also important to look at doing educational work within the archives. I don't believe as a lesbian that it's my responsibility to educate the world just as I don't believe that it's the, the responsibility of people of color to do all the work on racism. People have a tendency to not involve themselves in organizations where they don't feel represented and where they don't feel as if their voice is going to be heard. The archive could be going to some of the cultural specific groups that exist 
I know there are many within Toronto, there are probably other similar groups across Canada, be they uh, trans, two-spirit, gay, lesbian, or bi organizations. Of course, given the limited resources of the archives and knowing that everyone is a volunteer, they can't be everywhere. Um, so making the board of the archives and ensuring that the volunteers of the archi archives reflect the diversity of the community is going to ensure that those voices are heard, properly documented, and, um, and that the stories will live on you know, beyond the lifespan of myself and yourself. So uh, certainly more efforts have to be made in order, um, and uh, I think the collections policy and actually going after uh, particular co collections that are going to represent a, a more diverse point of view so that people when they come to research or when they come to volunteer they see and it, it's the whole thing about the importance of history again they see their experiences represented uh, and the experiences of people that they identify with they see that represented in the collection and so they understand that this is a safe place for them to be in a place that they want to actively uh, work at. Whether that means we're going to change the name to, you know, the Canadian lesbian, bi, gay, trans, questioning, queer, two-spirited, I, I don't know what that's going to look like, but I don't think that's a fight that we have to be worried about. I think we have to enter it with open hearts and a compassion and remember where we came from because, you know, when we, those days when we were just struggling for acceptance, now let's embrace a wider community in a way that we wanted to be embraced 30 years ago. One of the ways that we're going to be able to um, ensure the longevity and succession of our community is that if those voices are heard and documented and recorded and preserved and without, um, without us submitting our work into the archives, and I know that they're looking, um, you know, the, our voices may not be guaranteed to be heard afterwards. As a community resource, the Lesbian and Gay Archives is dependent upon the dedication of its supporters. The remarkable people who donate their diaries, their papers, their photographs, and their time. But the Archives is also dependent on the generosity of its financial donors. And it couldn't survive without their support. Obviously the ongoing challenge is always funding. Uh, it's, it's vitally important. The Archives has survived up until this year. Uh, entirely on private donations. There's never been a government grant. Um, there have been uh, some um, important contributions made by the uh, Lesbian and Gay Community Appeal and for various projects along the way. But generally speaking, the archives has existed through $10 here, $100 there, and through various fundraising efforts and events. We're embarking now on a capital campaign because being given a building is wonderful, but now we have to have the money to do the re renovations that are necessary. Uh, on a very basic level, this is a house that's been standing there for 150 years, and it needs to be able to withstand the load of the things that we're doing. We need to be able to build the addition. Um, so we need to go after uh, corporate um, donations, private foundations. There are a number of uh, grants that are available through the federal government, uh, finding opportunities that, um, in fact, we haven't even been eligible to apply for because a number of uh, grants require that you have a full-time staff member in order to apply for it. So there are a lot of doors that have been opened this year. From Alexander Wood to the Women of Forbidden Love to the queer youth of the Triangle Project, the Canadian Lesbian and Gay Archives have been keeping our stories alive for more than 35 years. And with our new home, we'll be even better positioned to serve our diverse communities. Canadians have been making queer history for a long time, and our stories will only get more interesting. As we, as a community, grow and change, it is essential that we document our struggles, our triumphs, our daily lives, so that those who come after us can understand their histories, search out their roots, and make their own futures. I think this is an interesting time for the archives, and I think the archives will, will, with the move, have to think about how do we, how do we place ourselves, or how do we uh, involve ourselves in the, the, the lifeblood of the community. The archives will become uh, 
will become a destination. It won't be out of sight and out of mind. It's also very important that we don't remain uh, a marginal archive as well. We need to be a part of all of the collections. We have to be seen not just as, a, as an adjunct, but as an active part of the uh, archival community and also people who are writing history in this country so that we can encourage the integration of our stories. We're aware of our history, we learn, we learn the lessons from our history. Um, we can share those lessons and share our history with people in other countries and other places that can learn from that and in turn can, uh, can work towards uh, their own liberation and their own uh, equality. It's our job to, give to, to shape gifts to the future. so proud of the fact that we are able to do this today. This is important to everyone, not just in our city, but all over the world to get a chance to recognize our own. This neighborhood is going to be our history. We are going to build more and we're going to make sure that no one forgets who we are and that our youth, our queer youth, have a chance to look at something and say, I come from that. You know, this I have a history. We need markers like the archives, like this statue. It will tell the story of those who passed before us and pass on the story to those who follow us. It's important for us to do that. No one else will do that but ourselves.